And now we're going to Rob again. Um, he is going to talk to us about Agile and a legacy environment. Um, we just met Rob as our moderator on the panel discussion, but I'm going to quickly reintroduce him here. He's a former Presidential Innovation Fellow and a co-founder of 18F Consulting. Next, he's going to talk to us about Agile and a legacy environment. So his question for us is dealing with legacy software is 0% of my business, 25%, 50%, or 75% or more of my business. Please answer and I will read the responses. So 9% says 0%, 24% say that legacy software is 25% of their business, 29% uh, say 50%, 38%, um, say 75% or more, and I'm sorry for all that percentage that I just said and confused everyone. So Rob, <laughs> I hope it makes sense to you and take it away. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. So what I'd like to talk about is uh, rewriting legacy systems with agility. As it happens, uh, m that's been most of my career. Even when I was in so-called startups, I was dealing with existing systems that had to be rewritten. Um, and I have some, my slides are kind of formal here, but I'd like to do something a little different. I'd like to frame this as a story. So I'd like to tell you a story which is true, but not factual. This did not actually happen. It's my attempt to um, explain the way you can use agile practices to rewrite a legacy system using a fictional story which hopefully contains the truth of what it's really like to deal with some of these uh, systems. So once upon a time, there was a boy named Rob, and that's me with the glasses down there, and he worked for a woman named Terry. And Terry worked at a federal agency, and she had a big problem. She had a big black box of software that she believed it would cost $100 million to replace. And this software was extremely important. One of the nice things about working in the government is that your generally have high impact. You're affecting things that affect many people's lives. In this case, there were 10 million people who used this software. And they were very grumpy people because the software was 20 years old. It hadn't been changed in a long time. It had a very clunky user interface. And because it was so old, it was very hard to make any improvements to it. And Terry believed that if she had $100 million, she could rewrite it but she didn't have $100 million. Furthermore, Rob convinced her that even if she had $100 million, she wouldn't want to rewrite it all in one fell swoop, but she would want to do it iteratively, rewriting one piece at a time. So Rob said, let me look inside the box. And when he looked inside the box, he found some interesting things. Now, this is something that I recommend for anyone who has to rewrite a legacy system you have to get someone who can build a map of the whole system. If you can't build a chart, and it may be bigger than an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, but if you can't build a map of your whole system, you have no business writing an RFP to try to rewrite it with government contract. So in this case, what Rob found were some troubling things, what we might call the mountains of madness, the desert of duplication, and by the way, Rob hates code duplication but there was a lot of code duplication in this system. And there was a critical river of functionality, but most importantly, there was a swamp. And in software engineering, sometimes the word swamp is used as a joke to mean a bug generator. So the swamp is where most of the bugs come from. So the fact that there was a swamp was actually good because it meant there was some possibility of successfully improving all the grumpy people who had to use the software by rewriting the swamp. Well, how do you do that in an agile way? So the way you do that, the accepted way of dealing with this is to um, use what's called the strangler pattern, which I'll talk about later. It was first named by Martin Fowler. You want to wall off the bad part by creating fences around it. And those fences are automated test and APIs. Now, in an existing system, often you deal with problems that no one knows how that component is actually supposed to work. And no one has ever documented the actual rules which apply. However, you have the advantage that the system is running. 
Therefore, you can build tests that just say the system is supposed to do whatever it's doing today, even if it is not the case that those things make sense or were carefully designed. So Rob was able to do this. And then he was able to convince Terry to be courageous and say, let's go ask government contractors. And that's this little guy with the hard hat here. How much will it cost to rewrite just the swamp, which is protected by the fences? And the government contractor said, if you've got a million dollars, we'll try to rewrite it. And that's a lot better than $100 million. Now, Terry was courageous, but like many government executives, she was very risk averse because there were 10 million people using this software. And if something got went wrong, she would likely be called before Congress and have to explain things. So she insisted that there would be a big abort button and she, her hand hovered over the abort button the whole time this operation was going on. However, Rob in uh, working with the government contractor, using the fences and the API test that was there, decided it was worth the risk to go ahead to replace the swamp because it would immediately give a benefit to the 10 million users. Now, Terry and Rob had to work with the existing contractors in what is called DevOps or development operations to make it possible to instantly roll back the change. Otherwise, Terry would not have agreed to make a drastic change to a running system, but they were able to do that. So we gave Terry an abort button. If something went wrong, she would be able to instantly roll the code back. So Rob said, lower away, the old swamp dropped out and a new pool was put in place. Well, so this was good because it decreased the number of bugs. And now you had 10 million slightly happier people, which was very, very good. Now, um, Rob, being a software engineer, immediately said, okay, now it's time to get rid of the desert of duplication because code duplication is terrible. And Terry said, well, now wait a second, how many times are we gonna have to do this? And Rob said, only 99, right? We just replaced 1% of the code. We only have to do this 99 more times and we'll have rewritten the whole system. But Terry went along with this for the reasons that Greg and Ann talked about earlier, which is she knew this was a new way of doing things. And she also saw that she had already made 10 million people slightly happier rather than forcing them to wait another year. So Rob presented the following model, which is just Rob's personal way of thinking about this. No one else knows about this or agrees with this to describe the badness of a software system. So in this chart, the, the higher you go, the worse the system is. So the badness is the vertical level and the number of lines of code is the horizontal level. And I assert that the badness of a system is equal to the number of lines of codes raised to the power 2.5. So it's worse than the square of the number of lines of code, but not as bad as the cube of the number of lines of code. Okay, now, how can you use that? It does, that doesn't seem to mean anything. We like, what can you actually do with a formula like that? Well, it means that a 10% decrease in the number of lines of code leads to a 23% decrease in the bugs. And what happens is, as you make even just a 1% change to the system and rewrite it in a modern way, you're decreasing the complexity you have to deal with, which each other chunk that you rewrite. And Chris and I, uh, Chris Cairns and I have recently published a series of, of essays which got a lot of play talking about rewriting things uh, chunk by chunk in order to both finance it and also from a software engineering point of view. Well, Terry was not completely convinced by this argument and her idea, she said to me, show me the money. But the money in this case was the bug count going down and customer satisfaction going up. And she did in fact see that, which was good because she got called before Congress. And so Congress, even though they had refused her request for $100 million to rewrite the system that she was in charge of, called her up and said, how can it be that you have only replaced 10% of this system in the last five years? And that was a very difficult question for Terry to answer, but Rob, who was very good at this kind of thing said, change the subject and talk about the decreased bug rate. And 
in the end, no one cares about the software. All that matters is the impact on the human users. And because the bug rate had gone down and the human users were happy, this was a reasonable um, thing to do. So eventually, Terry and Rob got old and they started walking with canes and they'd modularized a lot of the system and had replaced things chunk by chunk. But Rob, who was offended by bad software, said, we may never get rid of those mountains. But Terry said, as long as they are sealed off with tests, it doesn't really matter. And that's true. No one cares if you have COBOL running in your system, as long as you're able to provide a good user interface to your customers and move forward with the software. And so everyone lived happily ever after, and the users didn't even know that they had been saved $100 million and a potential flop, as Ann and Greg talked about, from a giant rewrite by rewriting things one chunk at a time. So in the slides, which will be posted, I talk about this in a, in a more formal way later. Uh, so now let me just run through this very quickly. Fundamentally, you have to have someone to read and understand the code. You cannot do this by committee. If it, you have to do whatever it takes to find one human being who can draw you a map of your entire system. Now, this does not mean that um, you have to understand every line of code. No one can do that. But you have to understand how the big pieces fit together, okay? And someone, and this could be done by a small team, has to define the chunks of code that you're going to rewrite. If you, you cannot have an executive do that. A software engineer has to say, look, I'm going to draw a box around this part of the code, and we're going to use that as the first thing to rewrite. That allows you to use the so-called strangler pattern, which has been talked about and named by Martin Fowler, to divide and conquer the problem by creating testable APIs to separate the modules. The testable APIs are very important to decrease risk. What you're doing here is you're not delaying risk, you're spreading risk. Every time you replace a module, there's still risk, but you're taking a small risk, which is kind of what um, and talked about with fail fast and take risks that are acceptable risk. So you replace the system, the system in situ behind test with automatic deployment so that you can roll things back, so that you never have big rollouts and you think of code as clay. Now, um, there's no industry accepted way to describe the goodness or the badness of a code base today. Um, it would be wonderful if we had the kind of rigor with software engineering that we have with financial models where we can do accounting and talk about where we really stand. But uh, I propose something like the square of the complexity model be used to justify rewriting things in pieces to executives. Um, and then I, I don't wanna go through all the rest of this. I don't, don't quite have time except to talk about the order in which you should rewrite things. APIs first, GUI next, persistence, and then finally business logic, because that is a way to provide the biggest return on investment for the lowest risk as you rewrite things using the Strangler pattern. Back over to you, Elizabeth. Thanks, Rob. That was great. 